Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this is our Boston Tableau user group virtual meetup. We're gonna be covering some great topics today. We're really excited about our speakers, Zach Bowers, Carl Asian, Rush and Go Hill. Um, I won't get into too much detail of everything we're talking about. We have some intros for them later, but we needed to get started on a more serious note. We're gonna talk about the elephant in the room. Because of the reschedule, this meetup is happening in the first week of November instead of in October. I know this is not a particularly popular topic in the Northeast, but I've seen a lot of hate spewed over recent days. A man who's a constant winner and overachiever, and that's what the people who support love about him. Yes, he's been caught in some lies and maybe twisted the truth a little bit, but he's still out there proving his haters wrong. Some people are just jealous of success and money. You add a foreign underwear model at his side and everybody's drinking haterade. You might want not have wanted to see him in this role. There's nothing you can do about it, like it or not. Tom Brady is really turning the bucks around. Yeah, no, I, I know, I know, I know. That's not, I'm sorry. I'm so, okay, okay, okay. On a more positive note, uh, we're really excited uh, to be here today to share all kinds of news with you and obviously our great speakers. Uh, we wanna start with our community uh, spotlight since our last meetup where we revealed that four, we had four ambassador picks from our community. Uh, we've had three Viz of the Days uh, by Brian Moore, David Borchuk, and Wally Alori. Uh, we're also really proud to announce that John Whitmore will be stepping up as one of our tug leaders as Kate Brown is stepping down. Um, as for KB, she's just going to be really busy on her morning TV tour, signing autographs for her droves of fans, as she is one of our two Boston Tug leaders. One of Vizzy this year. Vizzy's are a huge deal. Um, each year, the community votes for a series of awards that recognizes the best of the best, uh, really important um, standard of, of excellence in our community, and it gives us a chance to recognize everybody who's not a Zen master. Um, Brian, uh, this year, uh, the award for Data do uh went to Brian for his work on the SDG Viz project. And uh, KB won the Prep Star Vizzy for sharing her Tableau prep expertise, helping thousands learn how to use the powerful tool much better. Our sincerest congratulations to you both. We're, we're very, very proud of you. And KB's not going anywhere. She's still going to be around uh, the community and helping everyone out. Um, we're just, we're really happy for you both. This is a great award. So to get right into it, uh, for our first presenter, we thought we'd bring another 2020 Vizio Award winner, the co-lead of the Memphis Tug, a Tableau Public Ambassador, a featured Tableau Public author, two-time Vizio Award winner, the host of the Data Plus Love podcast, where he dives deep into the minds of the world's greatest data artists. And if you've not seen his public profile, I can assure you he himself is one of the greatest data artists in the world. The man who put the pop in Gen Pop Vising, Zach Bowders. Hey, Will, thanks for having me. Let's uh, let's see if I can get the screen share right the first time, shall we? All right, so I'm here today to talk to you about thinking differently in the way you viz, specifically the way that you do your public passion project vizs. But if you think about it, you can bring a lot of these ideas back to a lot of your work product as well. Um, I'm clearly not the first person to say this. The first person to say this was Steve Jobs in 1997, but I like to think I've got a little different spin on it, so bear with me. So I'm, okay, sorry, that's my uh, crazy six-year-old. That's that's the right picture now. Okay, so I'm Zach Bowders. I work at JLL. Um, I was formerly at LSAC St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. As Will said, I'm a Tableau ambassador, busy winner, blah, 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 but I really like making stuff, whether that be data business or podcasts or just anything surrounding the data viz community. And today I just helped launch with Judith Becker and Stephen Shoemaker, uh, Data Dare. So keep your eyes on that hashtag. We're bringing, bringing a project back from several years ago and giving it some new life. So keep your eyes on that. Um, I have two kids that are dyslexic. So bear with me for a second while I talk about this. I swear it's related to the topic, don't worry. Um, they are both dyslexic and dysgraphic. Uh, if you don't know the difference, if you see on the left dyslexia, this is not a true representation, but it's a font that kind of simulates what it might be like to be dyslexic. Dyslexic kind of an input issue. Your uh, eyes bring in the data, 
your brain is actually wired differently than a neurologically typical brain and what you process is different from what was on the page. So we first noticed this with my uh, first daughter when she was about six, she would read down a page and see like when three different times, I think it was three different words. Dysgraphia is like on the right side of the page, which is an output issue. You know what you're going to be bringing out, but what you actually put on the page doesn't come out like you intended for it to be. It's sort of jumbled up, squashed, words flipped around, that sort of thing. So, you know, some kids have one or the other and some have both. So you're, you're being hit on both ends of the spectrum there. Fortunately, my, uh, my oldest goes to the Bodine School, which is one of 14 schools for dyslexia in the US. Uh, at this school, they actually celebrate dyslexia as kind of a superpower because contrary to what you um, might think if you don't know a lot about dyslexia, uh, a lot of kids with dyslexia are really high intelligence. It's a processing issue. So when they can be taught using the Orton-Gillingham method, which is a different way of learning, they can actually not only read and write like anyone else, but because of their dyslexia and how they don't see things and process things the same way as everyone else, it really gives them an edge in a lot of ways. So their school's broken into different houses like Hogwarts, where they have uh, different famous dyslexics uh, at the head of each house, like Einstein, Da Vinci, Jobs, and Edison. They actually do house competitions like at Hogwarts as well. So they encourage them to learn by sort of stretching themselves and gamifying um, what they're working on in school. So why am I going on about dyslexia and famous dyslexics? Well, if you look at this wall, you'll see a lot of really famous people. And certainly there's been a lot of people that are dyslexic that haven't been super successful like Steve Jobs or Steven Spielberg. But there's stuff that we can learn from thinking about stuff differently and looking at it differently. So today I'm gonna to show you some data visits from my portfolio and talk about ways that in the past I have looked at stuff, whether it be chart type or the approach to thinking about a data set from a different angle and come up with a different product than I might have if I'd approached it more conventionally. So I've broken this down into three main categories and I'm gonna work through these and uh, hopefully we're gonna have some fun. So my first thing is reject conventions. So for dyslexics, they can't learn the same way everyone else does. They actually have to look at it differently. So when you're approaching a new project, think about the different angles you might take to approach it. And then maybe try something off the wall sometimes. Think about a way that you could do it entirely differently that might deliver additional value. So this first chart, is pie charts showing affiliation of different comic book characters. So there might be many ways to do this, but I actually found in this case, a pie chart to be a unique way of both representing the number of memberships each member had, as well as easily showing the members of the various teams in a way that's immediately eye-catching and draws the attention, but also um, allows for displaying of multiple things all at the same time without having to sort of connect them to different cohorts. Unconventional, yes. Uh, pie charts, widely hated, yes. But you can see there's nothing on here that has more than five wedges on it with the exception of the main chart showing what the different team affiliations mean. So in terms of convention for pie charts, this isn't even really breaking that rule. Here's another chart. I believe this one was kicked off of Reddit as being neither data nor art from data art, uh, which has happened to me before, but Exploring the concept of colorblindness, we can quantify that with the percentages shown here, but really what you wanna see is what does colorblindness look like? If you're not colorblind, you're gonna have a hard time telling, but if I can actually visually show you what colorblindness looks like and maybe a whimsical way like this that gets extra attention, that might be more telling to you than just saying, hey, 1.27% of men suffer from this particular form. It doesn't sound that meaningful, particularly when it's, you know, such a small subset of the population. But when you actually look at that right next to red and green and see what a difference that makes, that juxtaposition between the two colors, even though we're not actually using charts of any familiar type, can really help draw that attention and possibly make a greater impact than just laying out the numbers or even showing a more conventional chart for it. So this was a case of taking a sort of data concept and making something more artistic out of it in hopes that maybe people look twice and say, wow, I can see why people get confused with color blindness between red and green. I might need to be more conscious of that in my future uh, data chart choices. Embrace ambiguity. So dyslexics are used to operating in a space of constant discomfort. So. Um, nothing is sort of tilted in their favor in terms of society. Like everything's written out um, in long form. There's 
oftentimes you'll see stuff that isn't left justified. Um, and in general, it's just an awkward way to go through life where you're having to constantly adapt uh, to reading stuff that's really just um, not your forte. So in terms of that, I like to think about different ways I can express uh, visual concepts that might be ambiguous and how I go about approaching that. So one of these was the uh, timeline for Marty McFly in the Back to the Future movies. So Marty's traveling through time throughout the Back to the Future series, right? He's moving forward and backward. He's moving back to 19, uh, 1955. He's moving forward to 2015, the far-flung future of 2015, and all the way back to the Old West in 1885. But while he's moving in time, he's also aging and progressing on his own personal timeline, right? So based on the chronology of the film, Marty was born in about 1968. He's probably aged maybe like a couple weeks in the course of the film, but he's actually getting older while he's also moving in time. So he's moving in two different directions in time simultaneously, his own personal timeline, as well as the greater timeline of the world. So I want to come up with a chart where I could express two timelines simultaneously. So I have one timeline moving horizontally across the page, which is Marty's own age. And then I have one timeline moving up and down on the page, which is the timeline of the rest of the world that Marty is bouncing and back and forth between. As you can see, it's not a conventional sort of timeline. I mean, how could you represent this in terms of a conventional timeline? Um, so I had to pivot a little bit and come up with a different concept of it. Does it work? Maybe. It also might not work, but sometimes you swing for the fences when you're dealing with a concept that's a little out of the box. Another example of this is the movie Inception. So Inception has people conducting a dream heist by drilling down through multiple tiers of dreams. Um, it's kind of a map really, when you think about it, except in terms of location, they're all laying in the same place on an airplane uh, as they fall asleep, but they're experiencing different locations throughout the dreams. So I came up with a chart that could show the entire team as they descended down, who stopped at which layer of a dream, and then as they all came back to consciousness. So again, not a conventional chart type, not something you might think of when trying to express uh, a complicated Christopher Nolan movie, but a way of distilling a much more difficult concept down into a more concentrated single visualization rather than sort of explaining it long form, uh, which is you know sort of accepting and embracing the ambiguity of it. So my last big tip is to re reiterate relentlessly. So uh, one of the exercises I do with my daughters every night is something called BIRDS, which is an acronym. And it basically uh, involves teaching them words and how they work by breaking them apart as if they were, say, a picture. So asking them how many letters are in the word, uh, what the fourth letter is, how many letters are tall, that sort of thing. So teaching them about words as if they are almost characters, breaking them down kind of graphically. Uh, so one of the things I like to do with a data set is hit it multiple times. So when you're doing a work project, oftentimes you're using the same data set frequently and coming back to it over and over. But we don't do that that often with our public projects and uh, public data visits. But you'd be surprised what you can find when you revisit the same data set a second or a third time and what you come bring out of it each time. I've done this with several, several data sets, but I'll focus on one in particular which involves uh, US birth dates. So this was my first pass at it. And it's actually an interactive card. So what you can do is if you go uh, on my public portfolio, you can type in two names and designate whether they're male or female, because you know the US census records designate the two. And you can even change the header to like happy wedding or whatever you want it to be. And what it is, it's essentially like an interactive card. So the two overlapping area charts shift accordingly, and these two little icons uh, grow and decrease in size, creating a, a custom logo for each uh, pairing, but it's a cool way to show the relationship between two people's names over the course of the data represented. That was my first pass, and I was like, ah, oh, this is really fun, and I knew it was successful because my wife played with it for 45 minutes, and she doesn't look at my stuff ever, so that was pretty cool, uh, but I came back to it, and I'm like, I think I can have more fun with this. What else can I do with this? So I hit it a second time and I was thinking about the song Mambo Number no. Five and all the women's names listed in it. And at the time Mambo Number no. Five came out, if each of these girls was kind of born at the height of the popularity for that particular name, 
how old would they have been in 1999? So that was my second pass at it. A little more mischievous, a little fun. Mischief is fun. Um, and I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, we're, we're on to something here. Because who would have thought you could come up with so many different angles just on the idea of baby names, right? So then I came up with a third one, which was even more trolly. And I know this because people have now like messaged me saying, thanks, now I know I may have been conceived, so let's get it on. But the premise of this one is, um, if you type in when you're born, this will go back 280 days to the billboard charts of that particular week and tell you, oh, hey, uh, these were the songs that were billboard number one hits during that week. So again, iterating on the idea of when you were born, uh, but in this case, it's using the billboard charts list. So sort of taking the same concepts, recycling them, looking at them from different angles, and sometimes being a little mischievous and subversive with them, because let's be honest, that makes things a lot more fun to do. So my challenge to you, and I've gone through this fast, I'm just the opening act, guys, is to think differently. Next time you're approaching a new data project, what other angles could you look at it from? Whether in terms of the charts that you intend to use, or alternatively, the way you look at the data. What could you do that puts your own mark on it or creates your own unique visual language that allows you to uh, see stuff differently than others might look at it? Thanks for your time today. That was awesome, Zach. Thank you. I had one question here in the Q&A. So it was uh, from, I think you kind of answered this, but so how did you get from the baby names to Mama Number no. 5 um, and then the songs that made you, you were like, you talked about you were being relentless on that, that concept and you were just trying to approach it from any other angles or was and being silly with it? Yeah, essentially, um, oftentimes when I'm thinking about the next thing I might work on, I have no ideas in the can. So I don't have a workbook full of new ideas. I literally don't work on something until a new idea comes. So sometimes that means going back and looking at prior work and saying, is there still meat on this bone that I might want to explore? Because it's a, oftentimes easier than finding an entirely new data set. But I, one of the ones I left out was I did another pass on baby names, which became Mary and the names that define our generations, which won me a visit of the day which is a breakdown for each generation in the United States, what the most popular male and female name was. And it also shows how that name performed throughout future generations. So it's these area charts broken out by color that show like while John may have been really popular in the 1950s, it really waned at a certain point. Uh, one of the more fascinating points that was, you'll see a whole lot more volatility in the popularity of women's names than men's names. Men's names have been a lot more consistent and women's names have diversified more significantly. So men's names have been slower to expand in terms of uh, diversity. Well, women's names, there's a lot more sort of creativity put into that. But yeah, a, a lot of it comes down to looking for your next idea. And sometimes you might uh, be inspired by something you did previously, not necessarily looking at it saying, wow, I'm really great, but looking at it and saying, what's something else that could be done with this data? I already did one thing. Is there more meat on that bone? Nice. And, and one more general question from the group. So what inspires your design choices in general? I mean, your, your stuff is so unique. It, the colors pop so loud. I know you have uh, comic books as a big influence on you and popcorn. Giant. I mean, is there, could you point to a couple of your, your inspirations for your design choices? Uh, yeah, I look a lot at pop art and stuff like that. So when I look for inspiration, I often look outside of data viz. Um, because that's sort of where my interest lies. So when I'm visiting, I'm not often trying to recreate something someone else in the data this community made, rather than I'm being inspired by something I saw elsewhere. And uh, a lot of my visits, if you look at my portfolio are kind of single chart visits as of late, and by late, I mean like maybe the last 18 months, I've gone from trying to show you every little trick I can do to trying to distill stuff down into telling simpler stories, maybe using one or two charts in a more creative way. So a lot of the stuff you'll find in my portfolio, uh, you'll look at and say, I could do that. And it's like, exactly. Like anyone can do this. I'm not doing anything unique. I just found a particular angle that works well for me. That's awesome. Let me just pop our presentation back up here. Well, thank you so much, Zach. That, that was fantastic. I know everybody really enjoyed seeing the views and and the story that they had behind it um, with your kids with dyslexia and, and all the different ways that you're exploring learning with that. And it's just great. So thank you so much. Moving on to our next speaker. Uh, 
if you took an amazing head coach like the Spurs, future Hall of Famer Greg Popovich, a master data ninja with deadly data skills, but as shown here, still considered enough to wear a mask as not to spread COVID-19 while destroying his enemies, you get Carl Alchin. Carl is a Zen master, social media ambassador, and affectionately called the other head coach at the information lab across the pond, a teacher's teacher. We are very, very proud to have Carl here today. Carl, take it away. Thank you very much, Will. I'm, I'm not sure how I'm going to follow Zach because this talk that I'm about to do doesn't have any mention of Marvel, Inception, or Conceptions either, but, but maybe that's okay. It's Friday night for me, so maybe those subjects are all right for, for you guys a little bit earlier on. Maybe not so much. So we're, hopefully we're you'll see. We're huge data my... prep fans. We're huge data prep fans here. You, you have Kate as an influence. What can I say? Yeah. I don't need to say anything more. So um, hopefully you guys can see my slides okay. And that's all coming coming through loud and clearly. And um, obviously you can hear me because you're hearing the dodgy jokes already. So just for anybody who can still see my screen, I do have a Spurs vest right here because I'm talking to America. You guys understand that. You, if you're an Arsenal fans, you don't suddenly start booing. You know those Spurs are different. And I'm going to plug this book a lot. Um, so yes, just finished writing a book. So I'll mention that a few times. Count how many times as I go through this. So, but why am I here today? Well, I'm kind of really here to talk about tableau prep. It's not surprising. Um, I talk a lot about prep and also the importance of data preparation full stop. I think we've spent a lot of time over the last, I've been doing this with Tableau now for about eight years really kind of getting involved heavily with the visualization side and then empowering everybody that side but have we really kind of taken that step further back and empowered people with data preparation because i think that's the bit that we're missing a little bit within the community that i'd love to see a bit more of is we might have start personally using data prep and maybe tableau prep is your tool of choice around that but actually you know, are we got, have we got all of the right people in the right parts of the organization kind of taking that lead and doing and doing their own data prep where they can. And I kind of want to kind of spur a little bit of inspiration around what some of those other roles that you might not consider to kind of support and give a little bit of data prep love to as well. So hopefully your British filter is turned on nicely on your laptops. I'm coming through loud and clearly. So let's, let's talk prep because why not? So yeah, we're, we're going to dive into, first of all, what is prep, just in case anybody's not come across the term yet. It's actually a lie. There's no such thing as Tableau prep. I'll come back to that in a sec. And talk about this concept of self-service data preparation as well. That's that's kind of my raison d'etre of at least the last year. I'd probably say the last four years, if I'm being honest. And also kind of where does Tableau prep fit in in your organization, but also where doesn't it fit in? I, I think that's, you know, think about, Tableau prep the same way we do about desktop, but it's not going to be everything to everybody. So who should be using prep and who shouldn't? And how do you get started off the back of that? So yes, as, as Will kindly mentioned, I am the other head coach of the data school in the UK. It's such an amazing job to have and uh, just get to train the next generation of awesome people that we can give these amazing skills to both on the data prep side and the visualization side as well. Um, my background is as a history and politics student, so I don't naturally fall into this data world. It's um, kind of came in by looking at how organizations worked and realized that data was a massive flow through and nobody wanted to ever touch data. Um, so I felt uncomfortable with it. And like anything I feel uncomfortable, I just kind of dive straight into it. And that's how I ended up in this. I downloaded Tableau 5.2, Tableau Public 5.2. So a very long time ago now when I was kind of running running one of my BI teams. Um, and that's kind of slowly ended up becoming a social ambassador as well as a, a Tableau Zen master now. So I get to wear this t-shirt very much. So not going out in public a huge amount. London's back in lockdown. So hopefully you don't mind me donning the t-shirt today. And uh, yeah, a few months ago, I finished the book. So Tableau Prep up and running through O'Reilly just trying to really go and put a book out there to talk about this subject, but specifically around Tableau prep to get you really up and running what you need to think about. How do you plan that preparation as well as then go and execute it as well? But as I said, Tableau prep, it's actually a bit of a misnomer because there's no such thing anymore as Tableau prep. There's actually now two tools. So Tableau prep builder, very much like your Tableau desktop tool. Tableau prep conductor sits on the server and is going to be your automation tool but also flag up any errors you've got as well. So Prep Conductor only comes with the data management add-on with, with server. Tableau Prep Builder comes with that creator license. And, and that's my kind of first point that 
lots of people have access to Prep Builder, but are they really taking advantage of that and actually using it? The tool is quite new, popped up in April 2018 after a pretty long alpha and beta set to kind of get to that point. It was teased, I think, way back in 2015 or 2014 at one of the conferences and took a while to kind of pop out to the mix, but it's here now and it's doing some pretty awesome things. Really what we're using the tool to do is take away that kind of pain within data preparation, which is every single day, it's, it's pretty pretty hard hitting and, and heavy, but if you're having to kind of crank uh, through that data preparation task, it's, it's not much fun to say the least. So having that chance to kind of automate that work can really give you more time on working on what that analysis is, what the insight is and, and getting past that painful first step. And really, what I love about PrEP specifically uh, is it's allowing Tableau users to get stuck in to Tableau PrEP in the way that they're familiar with in Tableau. So calculations look and feel really similar. You've got similar terminology, you've got similar access to data sources. It, it looks and feels like a comfy warm blanket. So actually, when you put it on for the first time, it's like, yeah, this feels good. It, it doesn't feel like this really alien concept. And also Tableau is taking some of that user focus. It's, it's really always used and built into desktop and the team have lifted and shifted that to prep really smoothly. And um, that's, that's really nice to see. And ultimately it drives this thing. So self-service data preparation. Um, I started my data -re career, as I mentioned, running BI teams when actually I wasn't really the analyst. I, I was the person that was managing the team that didn't have the skills to do it. Uh, uh, a bit of a weird position to be in, but it was seeing that data was everywhere and, and kind of data wasn't great within the organizations that I was working with. I needed to kind of do something. I need to get involved in it and just kind of change the language around it and change how easy it was to use. And honestly, the tools weren't there. My guys were taking those SQL extracts, using Excel to manipulate it and, and putting it into PowerPoint. That's not a fun or good task at all where really the expertise within the business isn't within those centralized data teams, that it's actually out there in the business working away. At, at Barclays, where really I got stuck into Tableau way more than any anywhere else, and kind of there were three of us, so Pete Lee and I at Barclays, we were supporting 130,000 people. There's no way that we know their jobs better than they do. So it's empowering those individuals is a massive part of it. So we did that really well with visualization through Tableau Desktop. That opened the door to people to create their own analysis, take their own questions and go and build it further and faster. But that kind of pinch point where that used to be reporting was now getting the data to do that. Because as people think about those questions in a really different, insightful way, we've got to then race to catch up on the data side. But Tableau Prep, what it's done is it's opened the door in a really easy to use way the chance to go and put some of those different data sets together. There's so much on the web, there's so much out there in society now in terms of data sources that we don't even know exist right now, but a quick Google search introduces them to us, let alone getting shared from other people, it starts to change the dialogue that we can have with our data. We've got the tool to have that dialogue, we've just got to get it into that nice state first of all. And for me, that's where perhaps really lowered that barrier to entry to a whole load of people. Those centralized teams are so important. Don't get me wrong. I, I had many jokes about IT over my years in many presentations, um, but we do love our IT colleagues. They have built the infrastructure that have enabled us to do that. And we've got really frustrated with them because they are being this pinch point access to the data. Having, having centralized controlled data sets, super important. I worked in financial services and know regulatory how important that is, but having that chance to kind of go and work on it yourself to play back those requirements in a different way where we know that's the data we want and how it's going to work, that becomes really useful to both sides. So getting to that answer of that next question faster is ultimately what we're doing for us. So five reasons why PrEP does that better than anything else. Well, it's, it's built for the purpose. Tableau have taken their self-service concept and empowering the end user and applied it to data preparation. So the tool's ethos is exactly, is exactly this. It is pretty code light. I avoid the term code free because we're still using calculations. But if anyone's seen a, a recent post that I retweeted, Jenny Martin, one of my prep and data crew, um, she has pulled together a series of click only challenges. 
And the click only challenges, you kind of think they're really simple. And when I introduce them to new data scholars, they're like, this can be easy. <gasps> I still need to think. Yeah, it's a skill. It's absolutely a skill, but taking away the coding part of it, which so many people battle with, is a big part of it. So calculator fields, yes, they're still coding, but everything else within prep is largely clickable. And I think that changes the dynamic of working with the data. And also you're seeing the effects of the data as you go. I've got a little screenshot of from week two prep in, uh, in 2019 here. We're seeing the data play back to us as we go and work with it. The, the, the preview pane that kind of cuts across the middle, or the profile pane, sorry. We're seeing that within prep in most of the tools and we're seeing the data as we work with it. I used to have access to about a quarter of a million uh, SQL tables. Three were documented quite well, the rest weren't. So having access to that data, trying to find what I need to do, that's what I created every single time, that profile pane in Tableau. So it meant I could do it faster than everybody else, but I'd still have to go and build histogram after histogram to understand what was really in that data set. That's not fun. That's not good for anybody. That's not a good use of time. And the first time I opened Tableau Prep, that profile pane sitting there looking back at me and I'm going, genius, right there. That's what I needed. That would have saved me hours. Now that's as the data person. If you don't, if you take away those data skills and you don't know how to go about that, actually that's the first thing that you want to be able to do. Prep just built to really get the user to the heart of that. Also the tools built for iteration. As I mentioned, data preparation is a skill as much as visualization and the kick-ass stuff that you've just seen from Zach. Having that ability to go and practice that skill is really key, but we're all gonna get it wrong. We're always gonna be learning new techniques, new styles for doing it. One of the reasons why we started the Prep and Data Weekly Challenge. But Tableau Prep as a tool allows us to go and iterate and play and work through that. And if I make a mistake, I can quickly jump back, disconnect steps, re-go and connect them, rework through logic and ultimately share it. Talk the logic through that you've actually created with others. Those little icons at the top, super easy to see what I'm doing at each step and being able to document those in just a few words makes life really easy to both iterate and then go through that formal development cycle as we often have to do with most of our working relationships and working organizations. So that rapid development cycle can really happen quickly. Again, largely driven by prep. But where might you draw the line? So I've made it sound all singing or dancing. It isn't. At the end of the day, prep is not gonna just magically do, you, do it all for you. It's not this black box panacea that lots of IT softwares promise of, yeah, just, just feed us your data and we'll magically make it ready for uh, analysis. They don't say magically, but you know that they mean magically. So having that chance to use the tool, you do need to still train people how to use it. Yes, it's lowered that barrier to entry, but it's still a new skill set for most people. So you've got to give them that time to go and learn and actually go through and develop that. You might end up creating a proliferation of data sets. We're going to go and create new data sets. People are going to go and answer their questions in new ways. You've got to have a process in place to know this is going to happen. You're going to get this proliferation. So getting people to be able to go and tie these things together, get rid of the stuff that doesn't work, bring in formally productionalized the stuff that does, that is useful, that might be useful for others. Be ready for that. Be ready for that conversation. Exactly the same thing happened when we brought in Tableau Desktop uh, into the bank for the first time. IT were like, no, we're going to have hundreds of people creating thousands of reports. It's going to be another mess that we need to, to use and to clean up. Well, now there are thousands more users of Tableau within the bank. The tool is way more widely adopted and people expect to be able to go and do visualization in all of our clients, not just from where I used to work. It's become part of the everyday job. The reason for that is, is we've built those constructs and those frameworks of how to go and control this content. I don't think anyone comes to the table and anyone goes, do you know what we have too much of? We have too much in the way of visualization and answers. That's not good. Yeah, no, let's not do that. Let's go back to the four reports that we've always tried to run our business from or our organizations. How do we go and generate new donors? How, how many students do we have in this class? Whatever questions you're asking, data-driven decisions we know are the way forwards. Empowering people to do that is important. So yes, we should fear and be careful of proliferation of data sources, but that shouldn't mean that we stop. It means that we need to think about it a little bit more. And also with prep, it is still the new tool, as I mentioned. There are still new things being built. 
part of the challenge of prep is that monthly release cycle that's still happening of a whole load of amazing new stuff that's coming out. Raheem, Zahir, and Meraki and the team, they are crunching out a whole load of greatness every single month. Keeping up is tough, but also we're still waiting for some functions that might be there. If you've got some key tasks that need to be done, there might still be some gaps there. Can we keep talking about that? Just, just between us and everybody else in the Tableau community, let's keep talking about what we want to see from that. Don't be frustrated by it. It's like watching a child learn and develop. They're young, they're new. We've got to go and keep giving them the feedback and guiding them as to, to how that's going to grow and develop. It's already a good tool. For me, this would have solved most of the stuff that I had to do within my insurance team back in the day. But having that chance to kind of go and feed into that development is absolutely there with prep. So it might be a reason for caution of not using it for everything, but it might be a reason to kind of dig in as well and actually go and shape that future to be the tool that you want it to be as well. So where are some of those people that might be sneaking away in your organization and they haven't actually started to use prep yet, but, but Carl's saying that I think they should. Well, the first one is the obvious targets, the reporting analysts, the same people that are using Tableau desktop. Not every analyst necessarily has kick-ass SQL, Python, R, insert coding language here sort of thing. Um, you've got to go and empower those analysts to use the data that they need to be able to use. Prep is an e awesome, easy way to do that. There are a number of great prep users out there who also have the ability to code in other languages, but they find prep an easy way to do that or the way that they can then go and pass that logic over to others in their team. Um, or make something that's easier to rerun or error check. That's what we're seeing through prep. So reporting analysts start to fit into that space. And just as, as I was an analyst uh, for the bank, having that profile pane, seeing those visual outputs of join, so I then don't have to go and write more SQL code to go and check what I've just actually produced or not produced as the case may be. Having that ability to, for the tool to do lots of that for us makes life so much easier. And it is that handover and productionization of just once I know what I've got, being able to go, there we go. I know some people do that with Tableau Desktop. They would need to go and publicly face it out to the website, haven't got the cash to do the embed license for whatever reason that might be. So it's actually turning something into uh, D3 or, or some other solutions out there. That's absolutely fine. But having that, this is what I want to build as a working concept rather than here's my written list of requirements that I think covers everything that I need. That's never led to good, good place or happiness or not missed requirements. So prep being that tool where people can go and try stuff, it's a good place. Market research. And I always felt sorry for the market researchers that I've ever worked with because they are bombarded with stuff. Data sources coming in from lots of different third parties or different sources. That's only getting worse with the digital age. Having to go and transform survey data because let's face it, sometimes you want survey data in different formats based on what questions you ask. But having those different data sources and disparate sources come in en masse is tough to juggle. You'll often end up doing the same thing again and again. That's where prep steps in beautifully, to go and reshape this data, do that cleaning, join it to your existing tables, make life to go and create that one data set for analysis so much easier. And at the end of the day, it's drag and drop repeatable steps. Not being harsh to the marketers of the world. There are lots of good marketers who can use data tools and way better than I probably can, but there are lots who can't. And this is again, a way where maybe data is a small part of your job to kind of open up and solve that kind of laborious piece and actually really get to the analysis and the insight, which is way more fun and way more engaging and just more beneficial. But also business analysts. So this, by this, I mean a traditional business analyst who will look at a process, try and find the optimization. To do that, they use data. They were one of the early data roles in the organizations that I saw around me, beyond just the data, data folks. Taking and connecting to different data sources is tough. You've got to go and juggle that with the different uh, techniques and softwares you might have to use. Well, if you use prep, just like Tableau Desktop, we can go and connect to a range of data sources. But the difference from desktop is we've still got to have that nice clean data set first. With prep, you don't. That's where you're doing that cleaning and that transformation. So actually the business analytics community, I, I kind of see them taking prep and actually using it to go and first start showing what they're finding to their stakeholders. It's a big part of business analytics of, hey, look, I've looked at your process, I've seen this, it's not good, is this what you expect? 
having the profile pane allows us to start visually showing that data without having to create a whole load of formal outputs or even just using the preview from any step is a great way to get that data visualized quickly, get the message across, have the conversation to work out whether they're going in the right direction or not. So business analysts, one of those roles that again, all three of those actually could be a neat way to go. But who might not be the right people for prep? Well, that might include spatial, although we now have the announcement at the conference that spatial calculations are coming to prep. So we're gonna be able to deal with more spatial objects. That's fantastic. Until we have a mapping tool within prep and we actually see the spatial data on a map, that's not gonna be quite so good. So that's gonna be kind of a conflict that we have until it's there. Francois and the development team know that's a challenge. Uh, challenge has been laid on their door, um, but we need to kind of get there. If you have GIS or spatial specialists in your organization, prep probably isn't the place for them right now. If you force them to use it, that's gonna to be tough. Trade and area analysis, et cetera, it's just not gonna be possible. So kind of just leaving those guys for the time being or you know, keeping them up to date of what's coming might be a nice way to go. And those folks will be way more appreciative rather than trying a tool that's just gonna frustrate them right now. But also the true data science parts of the world where we're digging into deep predictive models. It's not what prep's for. We're seeing what's coming with Einstein. So as Einstein gets wrapped into prep, for those who missed the conference, that's gonna be called Tableau CRM. But that's kind of a bespoke use case at the moment. Until we can get our hands on it, we can see what the effects are, see how much flexibility we have. Prep probably isn't the right place to go. We've not got a deep amount of uh, predictive native options apart from the scripting step. And that does open the door to allow people to do this. To be honest, you're gonna develop most of that scripting and modeling in something like Jupyter Notebooks or wherever you're working at the moment um, with those scripting languages. So prep again, probably isn't the right place to go. And again, if you kind of try to nudge people there too soon, it's not gonna be the right time. So not necessarily how to get started. But if you want to get started and if people are starting to show the interest, sure, go and support that. Just might be some of those earlier roles that you focus on rather than some of those latter roles. Just like desktop, the Tableau videos are an, an excellent way to start. If you get the chance, um, the Tableau prep videos are building up nicely. We're also sharing a lot on the Information Labs YouTube channel. Um, Jenny and Tom, who help build prep and data, this final point, this weekly challenge that we run every Wednesday and post a solution every Tuesday, have just released 30 odd videos that are coming out across November for all of the different small aspects of prep. So a great way to get in and complement what Tableau has already there. Obviously, I'm going to say the book's a great place to go. It's, it's really aimed at people who are just getting started all the way through to some of those data management points. And especially now that we have right to database within prep, that's a really neat place to go. And uh, it's kind of giving you that kind of good end-to-end -end use case all the way through, um, all covered within the book and hopefully nice, accessible ways to go. But I will kind of put out a plea for prep and data. We're slowly moving stuff over to our new site. All of the challenges are still in the old. But come and get involved in the challenges. Also, we'd love to receive challenges. If, if people have got ideas that they want to share with us, come and come and do it. We can help you shape up those challenges, the blog posts, the data sets, et cetera. But what are you doing in, in data preparation? If you've got some challenges we want to hear, but actually, if you're new to this world, that's what prep and data is for. We really wanted to build this resource where we gave people the chance to go and learn this just in the same way that Makeover Monday, Sports with Sunday, Workout Wednesday, et cetera, have started to do for Tableau and continue to do so. For desktop, let's go and learn and refine those data vid skills. Let's use prep and data to go and start to refine those self-service data prep skills. And then I think we'll have some kind of really powerful community that won't just be about the visualization side, which don't get me wrong, it is fun, it's glamorous, it's awesome. There's amazing work out there but we really empower ourselves if we can go and get hold of that data and start wrangling it together. So at that point, I'll say thank you very much and see if there's any questions. That's fantastic, Carl, thank you. I'm actually looking at the clock here. Um, I don't see any open questions right now. So if anybody has a question that they wanna ask Carl again, please put it in the Q&A and he can type in an answer or we could uh, make sure we cover it. I wanna make sure we get to our our next speaker real quick, but awesome stuff. Thank you so much, Carl. Thanks. I have to make sure I get that buck. There we go. 
Fantastic. Awesome. So uh, for our final speaker, um, we wanted to make sure we had someone from the community. So we're, we're very, very excited. Um, in the dark times of 2020, I, I still have hope. I believe that someday we as data artists will never be asked to print data visualization on a piece of murder and pine pulp ever again. My hope is based on our ability to make interactive dashboards so easy to use that no, not one more spruce need die in vain. From perhaps the greatest technical university in the world, from perhaps the greatest city in the world, host of the greatest tug in the world, we're very happy to introduce Roshni Gohill from the MIT Resource Development. And she's here to talk about how focusing on usability has impacted uh, fundraising at MIT. So Roshni, take it over. Helps if I unmute. <laughs> Hi, uh, so Oops. as I'll mentioned, um, I'm a data analyst at MIT. Mm -hmm. I work in the resource development uh, office or advancement, just a fancy way of saying fundraising. Um, and I'm here to talk about how usability testing Tableau dashboards can help you build better products for your users. So there we go. So fundraisers, they're like salespeople. They have portfolios of prospective donors, like sales leads. They have annual fundraising goals. Um, and we were tasked to build something in Tableau to help fundraisers and their managers manage these portfolios and monitor their performance. And we call it the Fundraiser Portfolio Tool, or FPT. MIT loves acronyms, so I'm probably going to use these a whole lot. <laughs> um, and though we've had Tableau for years, Tableau is still a new, new tool for many of our users. Um, you know, that, that whole idea of paper reports, that is our, our bread and butter. They're not done in Tableau, but, but that's what most of our users are used to. So, you know, being able to filter charts and, and actually look at charts rather than, than just, you know, summary tables of data, that's new to our users. And a lot of what Tableau does is it's not really intuitive because they're just not used to it yet. Um, this project that, that we're working on was going to be the most visible Tableau project we had worked on. It had the widest audience, so all of our fundraisers plus all of the, the staff that support and manage them. So we wanted to make sure that we were on the right track as we built the workbook, that we were building the right product. And that's actually how we got started doing usability testing for our Tableau dashboards. So I'm going to go over what usability testing is and then why and how to do it. And I'll also show you guys some before and after so you can sort of see the impact of conducting and acting on the issues that were identified during testing. So what is usability testing? When I usually mention usability testing, everyone thinks, data folks, IT folks, they hear usability testing, but they actually think user acceptance testing. And that happens the first time, the second time, the third time, and maybe by the fourth time they understand, oh no, no, this is different. Um, so. Usability testing is not user acceptance testing or UAT. Uh, UAT is generally, you know, doesn't meet the specs. Like, is it performant? Does the data load and refresh quickly when you filter? Do the extracts refresh in an acceptable time? You know, you validate, are all the knobs and switches working? Is the data actually summing up correctly? Do those numbers match what they're supposed to be? Basically, does it work? Um, and in the past, when we built Tableau dashboards, that is more or less what we had done. Um, but on those projects, like I said before, we found that pe people People weren't really, really getting it. They, you know, didn't use features because they didn't understand they existed or they were too complicated. Or the projects that, you know, the dashboards that we had built just, they weren't useful because they didn't help the users achieve their actual goals. They may have displayed the data, but the data really isn't the end point, right? So what we hadn't done before was build the right product. And we didn't ask, we, you know, we asked whether it worked. What we didn't ask was, does it work for our users? Um, and since low adoption wasn't an acceptable outcome for this, this tool, the, the fundraiser portfolio, portfolio tool, um, we wanted to make sure that we were doing something different and actually building the right product. And that's how we introduced usability testing into our user testing. So how is usability testing different? It's all about seeing how users uh, perform real tasks with your, with your dashboard um, to understand does it actually work? So like, is it, you know, is what we're building intuitive? Is it easy to use? And if it's not easy to use, is it easy to learn to use? Because maybe you don't get that, you know, these filters exist, but maybe by the second or third time you've seen it, oh yeah, you know exactly what those filters are and you know exactly what you're going to click on. Um, does it help users achieve their goals? It's fine if you display the data, but do they, and, and you know, that you have all the things to help them answer your question, their question. But if they don't actually succeed in answering their question, well, that's kind of a problem, right? Um, 
And then the third bit is, do users actually want to use it? Does it turn them off or is it so annoying or painful to use that they'll actively avoid using it? Um, all of those things sort of are the, the reason why you do usability testing um, or finding out what, what those things are, right? So it's, sorry, usability testing is something that's done all the time for websites. It's done for mobile apps. Things like answering questions like, is it easy for a user to log in, to buy a product, to find something on the site or in the app? It's also used for physical products. So like, does this coffee maker have the right buttons and are the buttons in the right place? Is, is, this, is the filter easy to use and to replace? Um, so I actually have only worked in fundraising for a few years, but before that I worked in the MIT libraries and that's where I was introduced to usability testing. So our web team, uh, which later became a user experience team, tested various elements of the library's website from search tools to subject guides, and they used a variety of usability methods. So heuristic evaluations to see, you know, does this, does this actually, if we have these five rules, does it actually meet these five rules or does it break in all of them or some of them? Um, they also used, did usability testing. And I was, I was lucky enough to be the member of a testing team for one of those projects. Um, I'd also been a subject on the other side of, 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 the, the application um, for a web app that was rolling out for textbook and course reserve su submissions. And that experience helped me not only get sort of, it gave me a preview of what, what was coming for, for you know, my, my team, um, but it also made me understand that usability testing is a great way to build or in some cases kill user enthusiasm for a product. Because if you're on the right track, users are going to be really engaged and really like anticipating what, what you're showing them early on. Um, but if, it, if you're not, that that could hurt some things, right? Um, so the first usability test I'd helped plan and execute from the beginning wasn't actually for a website. It was uh, on the library's physical spaces, and we called it Patron for a Day, PFAD, again, those acronyms. Um, the intent behind the project was to build, uh, was to help library staff empathize with our patrons or our users um, by walking in their shoes. So we had staff from different parts of the library's organization and at different levels go into library spaces and try to do basic tasks, things like finding books um, and the restrooms and you know, more complex tasks like interacting with technology in the space. So this is a book scanner. Can you actually find the book scanner and then use it? You know, we have self-checkout machines. And then there's some technology that isn't used all that frequently, but every time it comes up, it can be a bit of a pain. So like, how do we help those, those high touch, uh, high, you know, those, those events that involve a lot of staff time and effort, how, how can we make that a little bit easier? So we even tested how, how people got along with their microform readers. Um, what we ended up discovering was a whole host of usability issues, like inconsistent or non-existent signage, um, instructions, just, you, know, it, or, you know, that didn't exist, um, differences in how materials were arranged, a whole bunch of things. And it took a while to actually address those those issues, you know, it was multiple years, but what was helpful from this testing was that we were able to ground and prioritize space changes, not just on opinions, because, you know, everyone can say, hey, I really don't like that color red, let's paint that wall in a different color. It's, you know, it's, it's more about, here's what the users actually said. They maybe don't care about the wall color, what they do care about is I really need to know how is this material arranged or where is this material in the li library. Um, so, you know, having, having those direct observations was really helpful in prioritizing. So why did I bother telling you about all of this? So when we were starting to build out the FPT, we had a series of focus groups where, you know, we had users uh, come in, we tried to learn what metrics were important to them and how they managed their portfolios, how they managed their staff. Um, we gave them prototype dashboards, and this is uh, an early version of one of them. Um, they each had two to four charts each. Uh, we asked, we, we conducted a survey with them, you know, to ask about the metrics that were in the charts, the the charts themselves and, and the dashboards, how do those charts go together? Do they, do they work well or not? And we learned a lot from the written feedback, but it sent us back to the drawing board and we went away from dashboards um, to like how I think Zach was saying, you know, focusing on one chart. So we went to our one chart options um, and uh, we had an expanded uh, project team and we started discussing design ideas for how to go from these dashboards to these one chart pages. And we had conversation after conversation where people were, you know, spouting all sorts of opinions about how things should be laid out, you know, what charts should we use, what filters should we show, what words should we use. And I don't, I, I can't tell you how many times I had to try to shut down the whole traffic light color scheme. 
um, we've we have since learned that there are many <laughs> or there are multiple managers, you know, in our group who are who have who are colorblind. And so these chart colors would mean absolutely nothing to them. They they wouldn't be able to tell that hey, this is bad or good, or you know, maybe something to watch. Um, so the bottom line is that we're not our users. We needed to figure out a way to understand how our users actually interpreted the charts that we were showing them, how they actually interacted with all the filters and other controls in Tableau. Um, and we needed to use what we learned to either confirm our design choices or to revise and test and in an iterative build, build process. So we're not just, okay, we fix it once, we're good, we're not gonna test it again. There are design elements that we would test cycle after cycle. Um, doing surveys just wasn't gonna cut it. It was just, there's too much, it was like herding cats trying to get people to, you know, to actually respond to the surveys, right? So all I could think about while we were having these conversations, you know, about traffic light colors is, well, if usability testing can help with websites and you can apply it to something like a physical space and get buy-in about signage changes, so why not try to apply it to Tableau dashboards? They are web-based, just like this. They have interactive elements, buttons and bars you can click on, and they sometimes have filters, just like coffee makers and you know, they, they need some navigation help sometimes, just like library spaces. And hey, look at that, just like a Tableau workbook. I'm expecting some like, you know, bad joke comments there. Uh, so how do we conduct usability testing? We observe, um, basically we observe five users, five representative users as they attempt to perform uh, specific tasks in the product to see what needs fixing. We ask the user to think aloud as they go through the tasks so we can understand why they clicked on something, you know, what were they expecting, how they're interpreting a chart or terminology. And we stress that we're testing the product, not them. You can do no wrong. Um, oftentimes that has to be repeated throughout the, the course of a test. Um, and we tell them that we want them to be open and honest. You can't hurt our feelings. If we don't get honest feedback, we're not gonna be able to make this thing better for you and everyone else that you work with. Um, and they tend to respond well to that. So <laughs> that's always nice. Um, so we have to plan the test before we even start doing a test. You know, you gotta know what you're doing, right? So the first part is writing a script. Um, and we'll look at a sample script in a couple minutes, um, but the, the, to write a script, we first wanna identify what it is we wanna test. What's the goal of the dashboard? What should the user be able to accomplish with it? What are we not sure about? So it's not just what's what's the, the user facing, like what does the user want from it, but is what do we want to learn about what we've done? So are, you know, are we using charts that we're not quite sold on? Are there filters that we're not sure are necessary or that maybe are necessary that we've left off? Um, are there, is there terminology that may be confusing or that we don't, we're not just, we don't know if that's the right terminology for this, this situation. Um, we also wanna learn from the users. So not necessarily you know, what they think about the data or from the chart, but what process and policy stuff is, you know, is involved in what we've put onto the dashboard. Um, for the things that we wanna test, we need to identify you know, one or more related tasks um, in which users will use the product trying to incorporate as many of those testing goals as possible. And we try to do a mix of easy, medium, and hard tasks. You don't wanna set them up to fail with the first task being like the hardest thing in the world. You wanna sort of guide them in easily um, so they, they get comfortable um, and they don't just like shut off immediately. Um, and then uh, we also need to add an intro and a closing. We'll look at both of those in a little bit more detail in a bit as well. Beyond the, t the test itself, the script, you need people. <laughs> so uh, you need a testing team. Generally, we have at least two people. We have a facilitator or a moderator who sort of wields the script. And then we have a note taker or observer whose primary job is just to take down notes about what what said, you know, where did people get stuck? What comments did they make about what they were seeing or expecting and that sort of thing. Um, and we don't wanna take the script out and just try it out with our first real user because sometimes we'll find that things aren't working right. So we also need to test the test. And in order to do that, you gotta get a couple of, of testers and they can be project internal people. Um, the whole point of testing the test is you wanna make sure the script is good. You know, does it cover everything? Uh, does it flow well? Um, is it the right time? Does it actually fit in the time that we have allotted for testing? Because if it's too long, you're gonna have to cut something. Um, and it also gives moderators and note takers practice. So they get an opportunity to like look at this, not only hear and see the script in action, but also familiarize themselves with what is on the screen and what they should expect. Um, Cause sometimes we'll bring in a note taker who hasn't really been involved in the development process and that's fine. Um, and then you can't test without users. So you wanna get your five users. Um, so you generally schedule for more cause people drop out. That's just life, that's what happens. Um, but why five? 
your goal isn't to find all usability issues. Um, you're never going to be able to do that. You could test 100 people and still there could be usability issues that no one found. That's not our goal. Our goal is to find the biggest issues, the things that are going to screw people up the most, find them and fix them. And research suggests that by the time you hit five users, you have already identified the biggest, biggest issues. You know, usually by user three or four, you've probably identified the biggest issues and maybe some, a handful of other ones that if you have time to fix, you can get to. Um, so conducting the test, there are two types of tests. There's moderated, uh, sorry, there are two types of moderated tests. There's sort of typical testing where a user goes through a handful of scenarios, usually two to four. We try to keep it at under 45 minutes. If it goes over, yikes, <laughs> uh, users get kind of bored and it can be overwhelming for the note takers as well. Um, there's also a shorter version called guerrilla or hallway or intercept testing where you focus on one scenario. Um, you may have multiple tasks or subparts to the scenario, but it's like one, one sort of elongated thing that they have to do. And those usually stick to 10 to, 10 to 15 minutes. With guerrilla testing, sometimes the moderator also takes notes. It all depends on what staffing you have and what your situation is. Um, so you can do the testing in person. And in our first uh, first round, our version one of, of FPT, we did almost all of our testing in person. We only had one remote test out of uh, 80 something, I wanna say, over various like sprints and iter iterations. Um, but you know, you can test anywhere the user is comfortable. We try to actually get to the user's desk if we can so that they're sort of in their, their space, just like they would be if they were actually using the tool. Um, but in these times, you can't do in-person testing. So we have gone remote for our second round of build, or our, our second version. Um, and we've done all of our testing remotely through Zoom. You can use WebEx, you can use any tool that allows you to share your screen and audio. Um, there is always a question of, well, do you record? Uh, we don't because there's paperwork involved. I think if we had to, there'd have to be a release and I just, it's too much work. And we have never really had, an, had any reason to go back to any of the tests that we've done. If we have a good note taker, if there's good quotes, they will take them. And if not, you will, they will come up when you're discussing the findings. Um, so that's, you don't need to record. <laughs> um, all right, so let's, let's take a look at the script. Um, this is the intro. It looks like a big block of text. It is a big block of text, but it's all important information. It helps set the stage because we, we introduce what we're doing, how and how the session will go. Again, we reiterate those things that I mentioned before. Think aloud, you know, you can do no wrong and you can't hurt our feelings. Um, and we let them know that the tool is still under development. You know, some of the functions may not work, so you don't have to test a fully done tool. In fact, you probably shouldn't. You should probably test as, as you're building so you can get an idea of, of what might be wrong and fix it before you're so sold on it that it's too late. Um, we do use real data. So that's the other thing, you know, we, we tell them the d data is test data, but we try to use real data or as close to real data. So maybe it's, you know, a few weeks old, um, but it's still real data. Because uh, if you, we've tried in, in other testing to use fake data or use someone else's data and like the absence of a connection to the data just, it means our users are a little less engaged and so the findings are a little less helpful. Um, and I'm highlighting here, there's a couple of lines in the intro that we change depending on what we're testing, but for everything that's not sort of in the background here, um, is fixed. From test to test, we use the same intro, just switching up this one little paragraph, a couple sentences, um, to, to focus on this is what this particular test is about, this is what we're, what, what content we're looking at. Um, so once you've done the intro, the intro is all the moderator talking, you get into the test itself, and you get the, the user talking, because again, we want them to think aloud, and to get them to start thinking aloud, you get them talking and you do that by asking some, some questions about them. Um, you know, we, we sometimes ask them to describe your role. When was the last time you did X or when was the last time you pulled data? Describe the data that you pulled for your last one-on-one -on -one with a fundraiser. These types of things that sort of get them in the right mindset and get them talking. And then we move on to the dashboard itself. Um, the first thing we do when we load up a dashboard for a user in a test is to ask them to talk aloud and describe their first impressions of the page. So without clicking around too much, tell me what strikes you about this page. What can you do here? What is it for? This not only helps them sort of take a breath and get situated and, and look at the screen and it's okay to sort of pause as they do that, um, but they also start reading and interpreting the chart and you can tell from the get-go, are they actually getting the data part of it or not? Um, 
And that's really helpful for us because if we, we, and we have presented them with charts that they're like, I don't know what the heck I'm seeing. And that, that you might have to, you know, change up your questions a little bit to, to help uh, the test go a little bit better or get, get usable findings from in that situation. Um, so this is the main content of a dashboard that we tested at the top. Um, and below that are some of the scenarios. Um, we, we named them after cookies because we lured uh, users to testing with cookies. Uh, so we, our, our goal in this round was to uh, figure out what terms uh, work in the context of, of the questions that we're asking or the data that we're showing. Like, do the terms actually mean what we think they mean to our users? Would the users know what they mean? Um, and we also knew that, that you know, they were going to want to see detail. They don't care what the number three is. They care about who is behind the number three or the number 53. And so we wanted to see would they get intuitively. They have to click on one of those tiles in order to see the detail. Because again, they're used to their print reports. They're not necessarily used to this sort of interaction. Um, so this is how we started. So this is the oatmeal raisin scenario. We started with the meat. Where would you go on this page to find X? For whatever tile they landed on, whether it was the right one or not, we followed up and asked them to define the term on the screen so that we could, again, get a little bit more understanding about what they were seeing and what they're they interpreting from that. And for whatever tile they landed on, um, we also asked them to, to perform a task that would have required them to click on the summary to see details. So um, we want them to click on a tile by asking them to pick one of the prospects or one of the proposals, pick one of whatever is behind the tile. In order to get to that one, you've got to click. So did they click? And most of them fortunately did. <laughs> um, so it's not as, it, it's very, you know, the idea of, of all you have is these tiles, there's no detail, clicking the tile, most people seem to get. Um, so we'd go through, you know, the whole scenario, or if it was a typical test, all of the scenarios, and then we'd close out like you'd close an interview. You know, do you have any questions for me? Thanks for helping us test the tool. Um, one of the things that is really tough, especially when you're starting out, is that during the test, the user will ask you questions, but you have to be comfortable not answering them. We don't want to lead them. And, you know, we tell them that out from the outright or, you know, in the intro, we're not going to answer your questions or we're going to, to, to go about, uh, go about it in a different way. We're going to ask them to elaborate on the question. We're going to ask them to talk about why they're asking the question, you know, or boomerang the question. If they ask, what does this button do? We'll ask, well, what do you think that button does? What do you expect that button to do? And again, that gets them talking out loud about what is going on in their brain about what these the different controls mean um, and all of these non-answers do does it does sometimes mean that some questions will get left on the table during the testing and the closing is an opportunity to, to fin to close that loop um, and there are a ton of resources out there about doing usability testing the Nielsen Norman group there's a link at the very end of my slides they have a whole bunch of videos they have a whole bunch of articles about uh, you know moderating more effectively like you know using silence which I'm really bad at asking echo questions or boomerang questions and that sort of thing. So, all right. So we've repeated each, or we repeat each scenario with about five users. And we learn, we learn a lot of things about whatever it is we're testing. We learn things like what's confusing. What did we think was straightforward, but maybe wasn't so straight, straightforward. So, you know, I don't know what this chart means. We heard that a few times when we showed a scatter plot. <laughs> um, there's just too much on the screen. You know, I don't know where to look first. What's the difference between these two menus or these two filters? Um, we also learned about what's hard. Is something that we thought was easy not really easy? Or alternately, is something that we thought was hard so intuitive that we don't need to worry about covering that in as much detail as, it, as we had anticipated in training, maybe? Um, and we also learned what users like and don't like, you know, is there stuff that we should do more of because they like it or less of because it, you know, this page makes, makes me antsy. Um, we learned one very crucial thing when we were testing our, in our most recent rounds is that compare is a trigger word for our, our managers. When we're talking about comparing fundraisers, that is just not going to go off right. Yes, they want to compare fundraisers, but they don't really want to compare fundraisers. They want to compare our, you know, does this person's performance match what I might expect? They don't see that as, as a, a, a comparison. Um, and so we should just not use the word compare. <laughs> uh, we need to set, set the stage when we're doing training in a slightly different way. Um, the Outside of just finding these usability issues, um, I mentioned this before, knowing what these issues are and how bad they are also helps us with prioritization. So we can see what, what's frequent, what, you know, how big of an impact is it? Are, are people recovering from some, is some of the issues and not recovering from others? Well, maybe we gotta focus on the ones that they're not recovering from first. 
Um, and, you know, again, we have that actual evidence of here's what the biggest issues are. So we're not going to, you know, spend 10 hours talking about our opinions about what color to use or, or whatever it is. We can say, well, we don't care about the colors right now. We're going to focus on this thing because this is the problem and this is worth fixing. Um, quick side note may not be that quick. <laughs> Usability testing isn't just about finding issues. I mentioned before that the patron for a day exercise, the whole point of it was actually to build empathy. And that is true of any type of usability testing you do. If the development team and the project team can get in front of the users and actually observe the user using the tool, they, they, you know, they hear those comments, they see how the user is, is, is interacting. And that, that can help with insights in the future. You, know, you hear the delight, you hear the complaints, and it's, it's a great way to also build relationships with your users. You, know, you have their undivided attention for a chunk of time and they have yours and they can see that you actually care about what they need to accomplish and that you're actually invested in their outcomes, not just the product that you're building. It's not about the dashboard. It's about what they can do with the dashboard. Um, and it's also helped us find some evangelizers, both with our, our tool, the FBT, and as, as well uh, as Tableau in general. Um, so I am running short of time because I apparently don't talk fast enough. Uh, so um, back to the testing. Once you've done all your testing, you've got to act on the results. Um, so we tend to, to set up a, a couple of meetings with everyone who was involved in the testing, an hour to debrief and then an hour to brainstorm solutions. Um, so when you're, when you're doing the, the brainstorming, um, you want to review all of the issues. You group and categorize them and look at the frequency. Um, and then you talk about uh, the the priorities, like what has the most impact, what can be solved, what's a bug, what's high effort or low effort, what do we maybe want to just say, we're going to handle this in training, we're not going to try to code it into our code or into the Tableau interface. Um, and then again, we brainstorm, we try to figure out what is actually worth, or what can we do to solve these issues. And sometimes multiple issues can be solved with one solution, or sometimes you'll need multiple solutions to solve a single issue. Um, so this is what we, we use Trello at I think in our first test, we used post-it notes, but it just took too long to like take things off of walls as we posted them up. So we started just using Trello. So this is an initial, um, before we did the prioritization, this is what it looked like after we did prioritization. Again, we got bugs, high, medium, low priority. There were no mediums. And we have a whole column of training. That's kind of how it landed. Lots of things got stuck in training. Um, so before and afters, and this I hope is the best part of this presentation. <laughs> um, so I'm going to show you some examples of what we've done. So this was our very first dashboard that we tried to test. Um, there's a header along the top that is just plain, like we were, we were being very minimalist with the colors. You've got left navigation because we, uh, we wanted to group things into categories by content and then have sub tabs underneath them. So we couldn't use Tableau's default tabs. We needed to sort of do... Um, some, uh, we needed to do something else and we decided, hey, let's just do a left nav. You click on a button, then you expand out what's underneath that, that section. Um, and we also had three filters at the top. One of those filters actually applies to this, this dashboard. The other two filters apply to pretty much every other dashboard. But we were thinking, okay, they're going to go into this. They're going to want to, you know, set it once and forget it. Turns out setting it once and forgetting it was really confusing because these, you know, the, the two uh, filters on the right did absolutely nothing. So this is what it eventually ended up looking like. Um, so there's a lot of terminology confusion. Um, so we had these little info icons. We tried so many things with info icons. We tested different colors, different sizes and different, you know, iterations. Um, and then finally said, we're just going to train on this. Um, but the, the, a couple of the biggest changes outside of just the look and feel is the idea of having our help sort of front and center. And I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but we have this need help section in the bottom right that not only has contact information for the people who will be the ones answering questions, but it also has links to other resources and again reminds people, hey, these info icons, they have definitions of things. Um, on the data side, uh, we learned that we... So in this first version, these, these two uh, bars for solicitations and amount solicited, we sort of grouped everything into one bar. We, I, I can't remember actually if we grouped them or if we just showed the bar that was most that was applicable to everyone or most applicable to everyone. Um, it turned out that that one bar was not meaningful to anyone. <laughs> um, we, some offices needed a higher cutoff in terms of an uh, amount, and some offices needed to see the lower cutoff, um, and some offices focus on the middle, but wanted to see both of, of the higher and lower to make sure we weren't spending too much time in an area that wasn't, that we're not supposed to be spending time with because we're supposed to focus on the middle. Um, I'm going to do real quick on this, this scatter plots. Scatter plots are hard for our users. 
we're still stuck with one, but we made it better. <laughs> um, so the last year or so, we've been working on our version two. Um, and in version one, uh, you, could use, you could select one fundraiser at a time and look at their stats. In version two, we're adding a team option. And when you add a team, so a manager can see all of their staff, there's two ways of looking at that. There's the entire team aggregated, so sort of like a, a, you know the team, the team is one number or one set of numbers. And then there's all of the people in the team, all of their individual numbers. And we needed to be able to give both of those options. Um, so, oh, and while we were testing, completely not related to the testing we were, we were doing, we noticed that most of our, our users, they have smaller MacBook Pros, so 13 inch screens. Um, and we were building for the 13 inch screens with the assumption that people would maximize their, their browser windows. Turns out they did not. And sometimes when you do that, Tableau doesn't, if you haven't built in, you know, using design, uh, the device designer, if you haven't built in those alternate layouts, sometimes things can get really garbled and there's no, you know, there's no instruction saying, hey, resize your screen and refresh. So that really threw off a lot of our users as their first entry point into the tool. They couldn't see the tool. So we ended up uh, squeezing the size of our dashboard down to something that was more manageable so that those people who don't expand their screens, they could still, still actually do things in, in um, FPT. And in order to do that, we had to either get rid of the left nav or get rid of the filters. And we chose to get rid of the filters. We moved them into a little filter icon because show hide layout containers, we had just upgraded, fancy new tool. Um, and we also, you know, so you click on the, the icon and you can show and hide that panel. We also added a footer to get some information out there to our users a little bit more, more troubleshooting information and information about who they can contact if they have questions about the data. Um, in terms of trying, we, we built this thing out in, in four groups this time around, and in each group we did testing. So the first group, we were like, okay, we're going to make as few changes as possible. We're going to throw the filters in the corner, and um, we're going to add all of the teams to this drop dropdown. Um, and we're going to add both the individual version and the aggregate version as two different entries in the drop dropdown. And filters, when you know, we talked to our design folks and they are like, is that filter icon really going to be noted? Or like, are people going to know what that means? If not, use words. So we did. Turns out all of that was bad. Uh, <laughs> so in group two, we ended up splitting out <laughs> the uh, team versus aggregate into its own little section. So in this drop down, you only have the one team. You've got Scooby Doo's team. You don't have Scooby Doo's team aggregate and Scooby Doo's team individual. You just got Scooby Doo's team along with the individual fundraisers. And then we broke out the team versus ag or the aggregate versus individual view with a little toggle button. Cute little toggle. It uses parameter actions. Turns out no one knew what it meant or no, no one knew what it did. So it was cute, but not really all that effective. Um, and uh, we changed the way we did our filters. So a word alone wouldn't work. Let's try an icon. We couldn't decide on an icon that meant filter plus other things because we had sort functionality in there um, as well. But sorts aren't really filters. They're, they're sorts, right? So we couldn't agree that filter was the right term. So we decided on settings, which is a little bit more neutral. Turns out no one knew what that meant. They thought they were, you know, it was like system settings, like on your iPhone. Um, so we did a little mini test internal to our, our, our group with a button instead of a toggle and show filters instead of show settings. That got a lot more traction. And finally, we decided, okay, okay, all right, we're almost there. Now let's just split out the, the instead of a single button, let's split it out into another type of toggle, a toggle that has a yes, no, there's a check mark next to what's selected, the thing that's not selected is in gray. Um, and in, the, in this, the third image at the bottom there, if you choose an individual fundraiser, well, there is no team view there. So we're just gonna write team, team unavailable, hopefully that will work. And it turns out it did. But <laughs> what we learned during testing, um, was that showing and hiding filters was a pain. People, I'm gonna go back. So people would need to show the filters to filter their data. Then they would need to hide the panel because it covered part of the screen in order to see what happened when they applied the filters. And then they would realize, well, I wanna apply more filters. So let me click on the show filters again, apply some more filters, hide filters. Oh, wait, I wanna filter again. And like that, that was, it got old real fast. So, I was presenting at the higher ed uh, meetup before, uh, bef uh, at um, Tableau uh, conference-ish. And one of the things I, like, I was talking about this whole process, and I was like, 
why did we choose to hide the navigation or not hide, or to, sorry, to hide the filters and not the navigation. And so we just, we tried another variety. And in this, in this case, we hid the navigation in a way. We always showed the filters and we, um, we moved the navigation to a top nav. So it's very similar to the tabs that you see in Tableau, but um, again, using show hides layout containers, we were able to say, well, these are sort of sub tabs or related to this top tab. Um, and that actually had the best results. It was great. Um, people were able to, to use the filters without being annoyed. They were able to find what they needed in the top nav. And, you know, it was very similar to what they might see on a, on a website. So we're like, yes, it works. Um, but then I did a little bit more digging. I'm not a web person. I'm not a UI designer. Apparently, there are conventions out there in the world, and people expect that your Tableau dashboards act somewhat like websites sometimes. Um, and we learned things that were really bad. So actually, I'm going to go back to to this. This was added this morning, by the way. So these little tiny uh, air carrot, or like the, the arrows to expand and contract. Um, so we had one user and, and uh, actually click on the name of the tab, so context and goals, in order to expand it. And that's often seen. So it's called a split button or split menu button, something like that in web UX talk. Uh, clearly not my expertise. Um, and that's bad because people might click on either the label or they might click on the icon and expect it to do the same thing when in fact we are making it do two different things. The words go to a tab, the icon expands or contracts the menu. And there were a whole bunch of other things that we were like, okay, if we can't do that, like what do we need to do? So we actually did a, tried another method from, from the web world. Um, information architecture one is all about where do where are things organized in a website or in a, you know, in a technical manual or stuff like that. Um, and how to figure out where things should go one tool that is or one method that's used is card sorting so we actually did that with a bunch of our users we asked them to you know take these descriptions of what these tabs are put them into categories and then tell us why they put them into categories we you know got some results this is this is an overlap of you know when did they group x with y um and we ended up with this thing this is our final version that hopefully will go out sometime in the next four to six weeks. Um, it's a menu. It shows everything. It has descriptions. It means that people hopefully won't get too lost trying to find tabs that they may not use that frequently. Um, and it also organizes the content in a way that is more relevant or salient to our users. Instead of um, putting tabs in, in similar buckets based on here's the type of content in the dashboard, it's, it's based around what the user does. The priority list is the stuff that they're going to go to every day. The next next column over is the stuff that they go to once a week or so. And then everything else is sort of more deep dive stuff that they're not going to hit that much, but they want to know that it's there when when they need it. So that's everything. Um, here are some resources. I can throw them into the chat. Um, but if we have time, I'm not sure that we do. Questions? <laughs> That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we do. We do have some questions. So much material in there. I, I mean, I think your what you talked about today hits just about every single one of our, our viewers and our jobs. I when you said the um, the issue your business user had with using the word compare and uh, acronyms and things like that. I mean, it just it hit so many experiences that I had as like a consultant and obviously as a developer where you would use the wrong word or you put something as a rate and it's not supposed to be that way and it just distracts from the whole view. So really fantastic job. But let me jump into the questions from the group here. So um, let me jump up here. So uh, yeah, yes, do, you, do you usually schedule, uh, I think you kind of answered this, said you wanted to have testers that were slightly familiar with the data, but do you do testing with totally unfamiliar people like the mom test that, that some people do or is it you know testers who are going to be using that data? So when, when we do these, like we did a mini test internal to our group of people who don't really care about the fundraising side, like they're the data analysts, like, like we, we tried them just to get a feel for the header because that part was sort of universal to everyone. But when we're talking about how do you actually interact with the, t with the, the data on the, in the filters and like actually answer questions, it's helpful to have, I mean, you really should have people who will actually be using the tool um, or a representative of the people who will actually use the tool because the way they think and the questions that they actually want to answer are going to be very different from someone who has absolutely no idea and who is, you know, struggling to understand are these, what are these terms that you're asking me to, to, to talk about or to, to dig into. Um, the mom test can help in a pinch. I mean, it's good for sort of like, it's kind of what we do when we're testing the test. 
um, but not when we're actually trying to find the big issues. Cool. Um, so another, another question here from a uh, two-time former colleague, Ian Rubiano. As a result of your usability testing, uh, do you have some broad best practices which you have integrated into dashboard design to help usability? And looking for things not specific to your data, so like info button, color code instructions, tooltip sentences, like was there, was there something broadly you could say this was always positive? So actually, so the way that we, we tried to hide the filters came out of conversations that we were having about setting up a Tableau dashboard, uh, dashboard template. Um, it, in a way, we sort of, we, we tested our template in real life and found out, uh-uh, it's not going to fly that way or it's not going to fly that way all the time. Um, so we haven't officially, you know, codified some of these things that we've learned um, because we've been so in this project. But once this project is done, we are going to continue that process of trying to figure out a, a good template or a set of like design guidelines or design system for how we do Tableau and a lot of the things that we are learning. So things like like um, you know the the tooltips, uh, sentences, or the even just instructions um, and some of the wording in instructions, microcopy in the UX world, like some of those things we hope will eventually end up in that in that design system that we that we build for our our, our workbooks. And I'll, I'll tag on one thing that you included in yours that I definitely include in all of my dashboards now, and those are the info buttons. Those are really, really helpful icons, and uh, it's part of our, our standard of practice at Amazon Robotics for, for me personally. So uh, I, we don't have too much time for any more questions. I think there might be one or two more in there. Um, Roshni, if you can check the Q&A, and maybe you sure. can answer those by text. Um, she had her contact Hello. information up there, so anybody who wants to reach out afterwards, please please feel free to do so. And let me just share my screen and we'll bring this home. Wonderful. So uh, fantastic job again. Thank you so much to all our speakers. We just have a few notes before we go. Um, a group that we've always supported and want to endorse is the, the Veterans Advocacy uh, Tableau User Group. No matter what level you're going to, um, you know, whatever side of the aisle you're on or whatever your issues are, uh, veterans deserve a little more than thoughts and prayers. We're very, very happy to support this group. They provide uh, services and professional networking opportunities for vets, their families, and anyone who cares about veterans' issues. Uh, again, be clear you do not have to be a veteran to join this group anyone can join they have a, a book of or a, excuse me a folder of terrific data sets um, there's a lot you can do to to help this group particularly with VA uh, data uh, and anything you can do to help or support this group even if it's just joining them on uh, following them on Twitter and, and publicizing them um, so again they're at Twitter vets ADV tug uh, there's a quick uh, go ahead and shoot that code if you want to, if anybody has their phone up and you can join right there. But again, it's just, it's a great group that we support. Uh, for ourselves, you heard our amazing speakers today. Uh, if you can grab this link real quick, I'll show you what it leads to and then pull the link back up. So this is our speaker application. Uh, anybody who wants to speak at a tug, just come in here, fill out some information about you and your talk. We'll have uh, some conversations about your stuff and we're always looking for more speakers we're, we're certainly booked up for a while we have a, a lot of people coming in but we're always having um windows come up and obviously we want to try to make these calls as, as engaging and frequent as it can and focused on our community let me go back to our point so again i'll hold that link up there for two more seconds just in case anybody can grab it obviously that we're being recorded and again, we just wanted to thank everybody for joining. Thank you to our speakers. We love you all. Stay safe, wear a mask, wash your hands, and we can't wait to see you next time. Thank you.